Welcome to the Serious Report. This is Paul. And once again, we're going to return to the issue of Chinese technology. And this relates to lithography machines. Now, we're aware that obviously ASML, who are the Dutch company, are the world's leaders in this field, without any shadow of a doubt. Uh, we've spoken before on occasions about developments happening in China. But I wanted to go back to the fact that there are actually very interesting developments going back to 2022, uh, 2023 and 2024 regarding patents being filed by Chinese companies relating to, obviously, lithography machines and how this could start to narrow the gap quite considerably between the expectation of when Chinese companies will develop technology that is comparable to the products offered by ASML, who of course are under huge pressure from the United States government to not sell the technology in any way, shape or form to China, except low-end technology, which they also manufacture. Now, one example of these patents that have been uh, filed by Chinese companies is the Chinese company called Shanghai Microelectronics Equipment, that's the SMEE. They had a patent which covered an EUV lithography machine. Now, why is that interesting? Because that was submitted by the SMEE going back to March of 2023. Now that was focused on the extreme ultraviolet, the UV radiation generators and lithography equipment. And that was attempting to patent the key set of components of an EUV tool, which is a laser produced plasma or LPP EUV source. Now, SMEE is China's leading production of lithography equipment. The company supplies customers in China with its most advanced lithography tool, the SSX600, which can be used, obviously, to make technologies only at 90 nanometers, 110 and 280. The company is on track to demonstrate a 28 nanometer capable system, but it's unclear whether it will start mass production of the tool. Now, to put this in context, because we always have to, EUV lithography is used to make chips on advanced processor technology, but this relates to 7, 6, 5, 4, and 3 nanometers. Currently, if you look at SMIC, it produces processors on its second generation 7 nanometer class process technologies, but that uses the immersion DUV lithography, not EUV, which is inefficient from a production cycle point of view and poses many risks in terms of yields. Now, the fact SMEE's patent filing happened when it did is a significant step in China's efforts to develop its own lithography tools. Now, obviously, it's very hard to say when the company will build one of these systems that can be used to make chips in high volumes. But it's evident that they're making strides towards having their own EUV tools that are more comparable to the ASML. It's also worth noting Huawei filed an EUV system related patent in China back in 2022. That also marked an important milestone for China to develop independent semiconductor manufacturing capabilities because if SME ever produces advanced EUV tools. Therefore, China can reduce its reliance on companies like ASML and strengthen its position as a semiconductor market leader. Now, we have to say a couple of things. Patents are quite often filed before commercialization. An EUV lithography machine is very complicated. It uses many high-tech uh, technologies it takes a long time to develop but can SMEE or Huawei make similar breakthroughs far quicker yes absolutely it's it's perfectly feasible it's not going to happen overnight but 
it's going to cause ASML headaches at some point in the future with, you know, if this hadn't been put into place restricting China's access to the technology, they would have kept buying it. There's no doubt ASML wanted to do that. But, you know, when you're under pressure from the US government in that regard, it's very difficult to refuse their overtures. Now, just to put some other context, just to explain a few things, EUV uses this 13.5 nanometer wavelength line to pattern fine features on semiconductor wafers. It's essential for developing nodes at 5 nanometers, 3, and so on. It allows the production of smaller, faster, and more energy efficient chips. And it can be used in technology such as AI, 5G, high performance computing, and autonomous systems. And obviously, most companies will use EUV systems exclusively produced by SML in this regard. Now, without EUV, scaling transistors to current densities is impossible using older so-called deep ultraviolet DUV lithography machines. Now, DUV and EUV differ significantly in wavelength and resolution with DUV operating in much longer wavelengths. So obviously EUV functions at a much shorter wavelength of 13.5 nanometers. So therefore it's possible to pattern features below 7 nanometers. And that eliminates the need for complex so-called multi-patterning. Now it's also worth noting some key players in China's development because the Harbin Institute of Technology recently proposed an alternative approach to generating EUV light. There's no reason why you, there aren't alternative technologies. And that focuses on discharge-induced plasma EUV source, but with a central wavelength of 13.5 nanometers. There's also research groups in China exploring EUV technologies in a multitude of ways. And China's investing tens of billions of, or say dollars, just to, for people to understand in conversion terms, what that would mean in Yuan terms. Now, China's bid to develop these lithography machines, the EUVs, is very ambitious. They are making progress. Yes, there's going to be challenges in relation to the technology. I mean, and also trying to compete with ASML's decades-long head start. It's not going to be easy necessarily, but China has the capability, it has the financing, it has the staff and, and the people to develop technologies. So at some point far sooner than conventional wisdom will have us believe, China is going to eventually develop one of these machines. And when it does, you can guarantee it's going to be a lot cheaper than its competitors and therefore you know the west will begin to suffer the consequences of the behavior of the u.s government who is totally obsessed with trying to crush anybody else technologically who might be a competitor but in the process now competitors become technological leaders at some point or can be and china is a great example of that now I want to discuss the subject of minerals extraction in China because there's been a lot of reports of a significant increase in mineral reserves that would allow China to become increasingly self-sufficient. And China is now looking at plans to enhance support for finding valuable resources. This is a move that comes because the United States is also trying to pressurize the likes of Ukraine in this case, to surrender half of its rare earth deposits in exchange for, well, something. But basically, we want our money back. Please give us them. Now, there's a push to secure homegrown sources of 36 strategically important minerals. That started four years ago. Beijing laid out plans that run through the rest of this year, and it will reduce China's reliance on overseas purchases whilst ensuring that it holds its own in the global <coughs> ongoing battle, in inverted commas, for valuable resources. 
So it's Ministry of Industry and Information Technologies produce this action plan to which will, res will be responsible for the high quality development of energy storage manufacturing industry and it wants to have an orderly allocation of mining rights and domestic resource security capabilities. Now it's expected to unearth substantial amounts of critical minerals so for example lithium, nickel and cobalt and if you look at China's copper reserves which is needed in the manufacturing industry in relation to electrical power transport construction it's increased by more than 30 million tonnes in less than four years. The amount is equivalent to China's total discoveries made in the previous decade, so you get an, in, an understanding of just how much China is developing, but also buying. And it's very interesting, China's established a 3,000 kilometre, yes, 3,000 kilometres, lithium mineral belt it's estimated to hold anywhere up to 30 million tons of lithium that's going to also not only provide self-sufficiency for china but critically this helps with lithium pricing so markets would no longer be subject to the control of western mining companies western pricing the commodities war is as much about pricing and creating an alternative commodities indexed to which the global south countries can purchase things not in dollar terms maybe in yuan terms but also priced in a way that will be far more efficient and cost effective for global south countries and finally in terms of talking about technologies it's worth noting the following and this relates to asteroids. Now, I'm not trying to uh, frighten anybody and tell them there are problems in this regard, but it's worth noting that a Chinese defense agency uh, recruited space researchers because there was a discovery of a large asteroid with, note, a 2.2% chance of striking the Earth in 2032. Now, this doesn't mean even if it does, it's going to destroy the planet. It's not of that size, but still, wherever it hits is going to cause problems. And if it hit an area of the planet which was densely populated, then clearly it would kill an awful lot of people. So China's built this planetary defense team as because concerns are growing over this, what's called the 2024 YR4 asteroid. I mean, and it was observed by a telescope at the New Mexico Institute of Technology. So China's got this team to counter the threat of near-Earth asteroids because of the discovery of this asteroid that could strike the planet in seven years. Now, the probability of it striking the Earth in 2032, as you said, is 2.2%. It is at the top of the agency's risk list. This is the European Space Agency, the ESA. Now, the asteroid's estimated to be 40 to 90 metres wide. I mean, this has activated a global asteroid response mechanism because the odds of its impact with Earth surpass the international monitoring threshold. Now, the Chinese centre, which is responsible for aerospace engineering research, recruited graduates to study asteroid monitoring and create early warning methods. Now, there are very math, various sorry, methods that can be used to stop an asteroid from hitting the Earth. And in the world's first successful planetary defense test back in 2022, NASA actually altered an asteroid's trajectory by colliding with it. China has made great progress itself in asteroid defense. It's working on designing these innovative asteroid defense plans. And they want to propose a Chinese plan for near-Earth asteroid early warning and defense. Now, if you go back to sort of autumn time last year, they developed this plan for its first mission to defend against a near-Earth asteroid. It wants to observe an asteroid and then hit it with a spacecraft to alter its path 
at around 2030, so two years before the risk of 2024 YR4 asteroid hitting the Earth. China, of course, is also party or part, sorry, of two international bodies that coordinate and share information and responses to asteroids or other near Earth objects. That's the IAWN and the SMPAG. Now, this asteroid is big enough to cause localized damage if it does impact Earth. Now, while the asteroid was likely to either fall into the ocean, it may also disintegrate to a large extent as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. But if it did hit land, it would create shock waves and radiation generated could destroy, for example, a medium sized city. Now, just to give an example of this, if you go back to 2013, an asteroid which was 20 meters wide hit Chelyabinsk in Russia. The, equi- the explosion was equivalent to 30 atomic bombs. It damaged 300 houses and injured 1,500 people. Now, obviously, the concern is this at 2024 YR4 asteroid, if it hits a densely populated urban area, it could injure tens of thousands of people. Now, obviously, it's not widely regarded as a serious matter. People are pretty calm about it, so it's not something to get too concerned about. But obviously, when they, in terms of assessing this, by kind of spring of this year, and a new observation window later on in, in 2028, they'll be able to better judge the probability of it hitting the Earth and where it will hit. Now, this is important technology. It's where technology can be developed that is mutually beneficial for everyone on the planet and something that should be happening far more often. But it's good they have plenty of notice on how they could potentially avoid this striking the Earth and how they can use technology to prevent it striking the Earth and therefore on that basis to reduce the risk of what it might do to people in terms of injuring them or killing them even. And with that, we end this podcast. Thank you very much for listening, for all your support. Please like, share and subscribe. Pass it on this on to other people who might be interested. Just let people know about the channel. Help us grow it. I would really appreciate your help in that regard. And thanks for all your help and the comments you've you post, which largely are very productive and actually uh, something that is of value to us. So keep doing so. And with that, I'll say goodbye.